Hello, uh, good afternoon or good morning for American friends. Uh, so welcome to this uh, IRCAD uh, webinar, uh, one more. Uh, you know that we are living in a certain quite particular period of time and uh, I have to keep distanciation with Silvana and uh, I'm not wearing my mask. Uh, and uh, we are very pleased to welcome you to this uh, session focus on Hyatalania. Uh, very important, uh, we focus on hyatalania because we want to uh, not to talk about gastroesophageal reflux uh, specifically, but more focusing on hyatalania, which can be sometimes a different disease. And to do that, we have uh, gathered a very nice uh, faculty, at least our guests are prestigious. Uh, today, we will have Carl Fuchs, who is already on stage. Uh, uh, then afterwards, we will have uh, Lee Swanstrom and, of course, Silvana Peretta, who is on site. And uh, tomorrow, uh, other uh, prestigious speakers like uh, John Hunter from the United States and uh, Blair Jobe, also from the United States. So uh, we, we're trying to bring some very expert guys in this, in this field. Uh, so the system of uh, this IRCAD webinar is made to maintain this interactivity. So for those who have not yet connected to one of our session, uh, the principle is uh, each speaker will give his talk, very short one. Then afterwards, we will gather your questions. So you have on the, on the Zoom platform, the possibility of writing your question. And backstage, we have a team who is uh, getting your question, trying to summarize and uh, to, uh, and this question will be asked at the end of each of the lecture. And sometimes we will send you some poll to ask you some questions about your experience or if it's using, using this or you're doing that or whatever. And that sort of poll you can answer on, online and we get immediate results. And that will also uh, feed a little bit the discussion. Uh, we insist on the fact that you have to be very interactive. And if some people want to ask the question by themselves, you have on the Zoom platform, you have a hand, you raise your hand and again, our guys backstage will identify you and connect you during this uh, 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 session of questions. So this is the way we're working. And so we're gonna start. Um, and our first uh, speaker is Carl Fuchs. Uh, I think that Carl doesn't need an introduction. Carl is a long time worker in uh, reflux disease, expert in uh, reflux disease and a very good friend of IRCAD, very good friend of uh, Sylvain and myself in the private space. So it's a really a, a pleasure to welcome Carl for this uh, Zoom session. And Carl will talk a little bit of, about the, 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 the treatment of hyatalania who, and who we're gonna uh, operate and why we operate these people. So Carl, uh, thank you for being with us. Yeah, thank you, uh, Silvana. Thank you, Bernard, for inviting me. Um, I, uh, I think I start uh, by showing a picture from uh, 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 my first slide. Uh, you have to download your, uh, your, uh, your, um, your talk. Uh, I don't know what's on the, on the, on the, on the platform the is screen, the, and we tested it before. Screen. Share your screen. You got it. 
Yes, you need to share it again, please. Okay, well, then you have to help me. With the green arrow at the bottom of your screen. Well. So you see it's really, really live. Uh, yeah, session. but uh, I'm sorry, but green button. At the bottom of your Zoom yeah, screen. Yeah. Okay, you now. Should, you should see a green arrow. Great. You got it? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. And, and now we need to see your presentation. Yeah. We started this before. If, if you click on the PowerPoint icon at the bottom of your screen. Let's see. To the left. Yes. Great. Great. It's over there. You got it? Yeah. Yes. We are seeing high to Is it right? <laughs> It shows you uh, um, uh, that uh, there are a number of classifications in literature, as you know, about hiatal hernias. I, I don't like them all because they are, to me, quite unlogic. I think there is a, a large group of hernias that are connected with reflux disease, as Bernard has pointed out. And this is a smaller group, maybe 10 to 15% that are more connected to uh, mechanical anatomical alterations that may lead very rarely to strangulations. And usually these patients have pain and not reflux. And these patients sometimes get more an emergency or early uh, operation. And therefore they will definitely benefit from a hiatal hernia repair because otherwise they're really in trouble. So on the left side of this slide, you see the, the chain of developments from uh, the anatomical physiologic situation all the way down to a thoracic uh, stomach or a mixed hernia, or uh, as I learned in the, in the United States uh, or in, in many parts of the world, any bigger hernia today is basically called a paraesophageal hernia even though it, it is not a true paraesophageal hernia. So if we, uh, we, if we get to this uh, uh, situation, I also would like to mention before we uh, go into the details about who benefits, uh, if we say a hernia has a, a size of five centimeters, uh, it is very often forgotten that the hernia or the, the anatomical changes have already been much larger because usually the, the cardia is below the diaphragm fixed with a phrenoesophageal ligament. So if we say a small hernia of two or three centimeters, the, 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 the anatomical alteration is usually already bigger because it, it has already done the way into the, into the hiatal opening. Now, this is a list of patients that in my opinion benefit uh, from uh, hiatal hernia repair. And I, as again, I separate the, 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 the anatomical alterations with the danger of strangulation from the um, uh, In our data bank, basically I looked um, uh, at, at different sizes of furnace measured endoscopically. Uh, when uh, you can see that there is not much of a difference if you use the gastrointestinal quality of life score, depending on the size. You may have uh, uh, patients where reflux is playing a role in the limitation of quality of life uh, with a small hernia, and you may have patients with reasons for reduction in quality of life. But the important message is um, if you, uh, operate on these patients, and again, this is from our data bank, depending on the size, uh, if these patients have associated reflux disease, it doesn't matter what size hernia there is, you will be able, if you make a, a good decision on your indications, you will improve the quality of life in the majority of the patients, as has been shown in many studies from many surgical groups. 
So um, uh, it can be a small hernia, it can be a large hernia. And why is that? Well, I think that is also because um, there is a connection between the acid exposure and the hiatal hernia size. So the higher this, the bigger the size of the hernia, the more you have a chance of having a, a large, a higher acid exposure characterized, for example, by the pH score. And that leads to a list of, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, criteria that has been fixed in the EAS, the reflux disease. As uh, Bernard pointed out, we don't want to focus on reflux, but it's, it's hiatal hernia is definitely one of the important criteria in establishing an indication for um, reflux disease. And many other of these uh, uh, arguments care for this. If you follow this criteria of indication and select your patients well, that has been shown by many groups around the world, then you can improve the quality of life in the majority of the patients. And that remains over time very stable and, and, and it keeps up. And this has been recently again uh, shown that even in, in large hernias with, associated with reflux disease, you will have a, uh, an improvement in quality of life. If the patient decides, I know I don't want to, I don't want to have an operation, I continue with uh, my medical therapy, the changes in quality of life are not that high as those selected for operation. Um, and if, vice versa, if you look for the, for the failures uh, um, uh, after a long time, uh, you can see that the patients, most patients will benefit from a hiatal hernia repair associated with reflux disease. And now we leave reflux and we come to more, uh, to more uh, rare uh, situations, but they are not so rare if you run a specialized unit for uh, uh, these operations, because then you see quite uh, uh, many patients. Uh, one, the, uh, the gastric uh, uh, um, ulcers and uh, associated with anemia, and we recently published uh, a series from the uh, University of California. And we could show that um, uh, if you have an ulceration, you could have a resolution of the anemia in 50%. If you have patients even without identifiable lesion, and therefore uh, it is important that also you operate on patients that not necessarily have a, um, a ulcer, if there is an anemia, there is an indication together with the size of the hiatal hernia because you can improve the anemia in more than 70% of these patients. So that I think is also an important indication and has been discussed very often controversially and many of the doctors don't know this fact and it should be, it should be more uh, 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 spread around their community that this is an important indication. Hiatal hernia in patients with respiratory symptoms. There are uh, nice uh, studies uh, um, from uh, uh, Seattle and uh, the big one uh, in 2012 shows that you get an improvement uh, of different uh, parameters of the respiratory function with significant changes, uh, which means that uh, you should you know, select these patients, you do the uh, respiratory function studies and among these, 120 patients with parasophageal hernias, uh, no uh, patient was lost and the improvement was substantial in these patients. And this was even more recent study from last year showing that uh, the, the functional study results improved by 80% uh, postoperatively. And what is important is with a very low a problem, a, a mortality rate in the first series, the mortality was none. I say this because in the, in the past, this was also an argument for people against this operation and this situation because they, they claimed that with open surgery, the mortality was high. This is not the case in laparoscopic surgery. And then finally, I think also is the very often known this fact and, and, and spread around among the surgeons. This is in our series, a, um, 
a, uh, 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 an overview of the necessity of esophageal lengthening. So it's not, it's not a, a frequent problem, but it can be a problem. And if you have a large hiatal hernia, it may be due to a, uh, um, to a short esophagus. And I think it's important to operate on these patients early because they may benefit, especially you may avoid to have a necessary lengthening procedure in the future if you wait too long. This also accounts for many patients with, uh, with a migration even after the first operation, which, which may need then a, uh, even a resection uh, because uh, after several redos, uh, this may be necessary. And so I think patients with large hiatal hernias you should have a very keen to, to establish an indication as early as possible. Um, again, the mortality has been questioned recently that show that um, the mortality is in these operations quite low compared to the old times with open operation, but this information still is around in the medical community. So in summary, I think patients of course, with gastroesophageal reflux disease, but also those with other problems associated with large hiatal hernias should be operated in experienced esophageal centers. And the, the, of course, the, the, the uh, indication should be established among many other factors by decreased quality of life. Thank you. We had some little problem with the the flow of the information, but uh, I think that everyone has got the uh, fundamental information about uh, from your lecture and you cover really very well the topic, separating a little bit the problem of GERD and the problem of large hyatalania. And really during this lecture, this uh, session, we will focus a little bit more on the side of paraesophageal hernia. So it's a, it's a very nice introduction. So you know, we know a little bit more about the patients who need some some surgery. So now I will go uh, towards the uh, backstage and see if uh, the team with uh, Madi, Rita, and Ayaki do have some questions from the audience to start. Madi. Just wanted to start with one poll question to get to know our audience, and we're going to show the question, please. And it is about the number of procedures that you have done so far. Is it never? Is it less than 50? Is it between 50 and 100? Or is it over 100? Could you please select one of these choices? While we are waiting, there's a question for Professor Fuchs. Um, it's most likely that some of our audience do not have uh, the experience with hiatal hernia repair that you have. What is your best advice that you can give a young surgeon that wants to start doing these procedures? He should go to an experienced surgeon and observe him to do it and learn how he establishes the indication, what kind of patients he selects, because I think there are two major things. One is selection of patients and the other is the technical aspect during the operation. You need to have both to have good results. I think that's a very clear advice. Thank you very much. We can now show the results of the poll. Can we show them on the screen? Yeah, perfect. So the half of our audience, and we have a couple of hundred now with us, um, do less than 50, per, uh, 50 procedures as a first uh, surgeon. And about 14% did more than 100. So we have a couple of questions now, and we're going to select some maybe easier, some more difficult questions to serve everyone. One of the questions is, what is the definition of a large hiatus hernia? That is an excellent question, because I would say it's quite unclear. Um, uh, probably 40 years ago or 50 years ago, uh, a Skinner uh, gave uh, an order to a fellow to, to evaluate his thousand operations. And during a, a, a night uh, study, they probably decided that three centimeters could be a good cutoff line. Because I looked very uh, uh, accurately through the literature and I couldn't find really a, a, a clear cut definition when this was first based on what data established. So it, it emerged in the 60s, these three centimeters. 
And today we, we often use the five centimeters as a, as a large hiatal hernia. Again, I, I want to uh, emphasize the fact that if, the, if you measure endoscopically already three centimeters, your cardia has already done away from the abdominal cavity into the hiatus and above. So it's in fact, anatomically, it's already a five centimeter. So I, I, to me, I think that this, the answer is currently without any good data, somewhere between three and five centimeters. I, I would like to comment on that because when we look at specific papers on what we're calling uh, paraesophageal hernia, people are usually reporting that at least 50% of the stomach should be above the diaphragm. So this is what we can see in the vast majority of the papers really focusing on paraesophageal hernia repair. Uh, but Carl is right, is uh, five centimeters means maybe eight centimeters. So uh, these are large hiatal hernias, uh, but the people are talking about very large hiatal hernia or giant hiatal hernias. And usually it's at least 50% of the stomach. And uh, we will ask a question to Silvana. Uh, what do you think about this size that is defined in the literature? You know, I think that a lot of people have different opinions and, uh, and uh, an impression about size. I think it's something that you should measure because large doesn't mean anything. Uh, maybe. I, I think that maybe there is one, <laughs> one way to appreciate the size of a hernia is then when you're starting to have a hernia sac, means that you're starting to deal with the large hiatal hernias. Usually when you have small sliding hiatal hernia, like the one that we're seeing in reflex disease, it's about two to three centimeters. You don't have a real sac. You just open the frontoesophageal ligament. This is a little bit distended, but there is no a true hernia sac. So when we're talking about large or giant paraesophageal hernia, you have a sac. And we will see in the next lecture that Silvana will show now, that when we're dealing with this large hiatal hernia, one key step of the operation is to reduce this hernia. And while reducing this hernia, you will see that there is a sac. And this is a key step of a laparoscopic operation or open operation when you're dealing with this very large or giant hiatal hernia. So Carl, thank you very much. And we will move, we will move to the next. And uh, right. Silvana will present the, the way we're doing here uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Strasbourg. Uh, there are a lot of discussion that are open after this presentation, and you have seen that in the program, you we will discuss about the diaphragmatic repair, the crural repair, reinforcement, no reinforcement. This is a very specific topic that will be addressed by Blair Job. We will talk about the length of the esophagus, which is also a very important issue that Carl mentioned, and that will be discussed by uh, Lee Swanson. So Silvana will show you, I would say, uh, rather simple uh, repair of the powers of Agelania and the way we're doing it. Thank you, Silvana. Thank you, Bernard. And um, I, I was asked to talk about the critical steps and some of them are simple, depending on the patient can also be uh, pretty complex, but we'll go um, step by step so that uh, we can cover everything you need to know. Uh, the first thing you want to start with is the dissection of the sac. And that is very important because the first thing is the, to identify the sac and work outside the sac. And we're going to cover how much you have to mobilize the esophagus, how you're going to close your hiatus, and if you need to add any other um, additional steps such as a funduplication, esophageal lengthening, and uh, eventually also gastropexy. Uh, but let's uh, start with the basics, uh, how you should position your ports uh, when approaching a hyal hernia uh, repair. Uh, it is very important to place your camera properly, and this means avoid the umbilicus, but place your trocker above the umbilicus. I would say five to eight centimeter above the umbilicus. That's very important because it's gonna provide you a direct vision into the hiatus and you're gonna be very comfortable in uh, operating within the mediastinum. If you're too low, especially if the patient is slightly fat or morbidly obese, uh, you're not gonna reach the hiatus and you're not gonna be seeing comfortably your operating field. I would suggest for you to use a 30 degree scope and uh, if you can, of course, course have somebody who knows how to use a 30 degree scope this is very useful uh, if you have to work in the mediastinum and it's very useful also if you want to do a full duplication and you want to mobilize the short gastric vessels 
if you have somebody who's uncomfortable with 30 degree, do use a, a zero degree scope because that's going to be much better. We use a very peculiar uh, positioning of the ports. You see that the operator has the two uh, five millimeter ports very high, just below uh, the uh, left costal margin. This is how we do it here, but nothing prevents you from placing them on both hypochondria. Uh, first thing first, identification of, of the sac uh, and identification of the landmark. We like to start on the right side, on the right pillar. We like to skeletonize the pillar, preserving the peritoneum on the muscle, and then very, very gently, bluntly identifying the sac. This is very important. If you identify the sac, your operation is going to be very easy and it's going to be very safe. Uh, the sac will allow you to uh, dissect it out uh, in a blunt fashion on an avascular plane. Uh, take your time really to see where the sac is and to differentiate between the diaphragm and the sac. Um, you can then proceed towards the um, left pillar as shown here. Uh, going 360 degree to the basic uh, um, of the um, of the hiatus. If you like to uh, start on the left side and then do uh, the opposite, so go from the left to the right side, that is also okay. In case of a redo operation, sometimes it's easier to start right in the middle of the diaphragm. But the most important thing is work outside the sac. Uh, this will allow you also to preserve the mediastinal structures, especially if the patient is obese. Um, if you don't identify the sac, you can lose yourself within the mediastinum and you, you're going to be uh, in a situation when anatomy is going to be very difficult to identify. Um, the sac also provides a very nice traction uh, structure that you can um, uh, very comfortably give to your assistant that can pull onto the sac. And as I mentioned before, this plane is totally vascular. You just have to keep changing the traction in order to pull the sac outside the, uh, uh, the chest, as you can see here. While you're doing this, uh, very often you will run into a uh, big lipoma that was going to prevent you from clearly seeing uh, the, uh, the esophagus. You just have to take the lipoma within the sac down uh, without keeping it into the chest. So this is a very important important step. And once again, uh, do this at the beginning of the operation is going to simplify your operation is going to prevent you from injuring uh, the esophagus, the pleura, you can see how easy the pleura is literally peeled out of uh, out of the sac. And then you will finally see the esophagus. And once you've seen the esophagus, you can just move everything out. Uh, the other very important step um, uh, is a, to learn how to play around with fat. Unfortunately, here in, uh, in Alsace, I don't know if uh, everywhere else in France, but here we have patients that are morbidly obese usually. And uh, no matter what kind of operation we're doing, even if it's not a bariatric operation, I think at least the same thing in the United States, you'll have patients that have huge lipomas. And um, uh, you will need to um, bring the lipoma down and usually this lipoma is sitting where you don't want it, at the level of the gastroesophageal junction. So you have to learn to play with the fat. And sometimes a good trick is to start mobilizing the sac and once in a while just pull the fat down uh, uh, and, uh, and the, um, the omentum down. Sometimes the omentum is also within, uh, within the, um, the hernia, as you can see here. So this is totally possible. You just have to be patient and trying to manipulate the fat correctly, uh, uh, always grasp grasping onto uh, the sac, avoiding to grasp onto the lipoma because that's going to start bleeding. But um, do it blindly and, uh, and um, you will uh, finally be able to um, take everything down and, um, and clearly see the, um, the esophagus as shown here. Um, once you have dissected out the sac, it is important to remove it properly. This is a very tedious part of the operation, but it's a very important one because uh, if you don't remove the sac, it can be uh, a cause of recurrence. And it also helps to clear the anatomy so you can identify correctly the gastroesophageal junction. And if you're willing and if the patient needs a fundoplication, will also allow you to place nicely uh, your fundoplication. 
Uh, esophageal mobilization is very important. It's one of the key step of the procedure. Uh, you really want to bring back into the abdomen mm -hmm. the gastroesophageal junction for at least two centimeter in order to restore the anti-reflux barrier. Um, it could it can be challenging in some patients because uh, very often this patient can have a, uh, a an esophagus that is not that long, and uh, you have to be prepared to deal with a short esophagus. We always Always mobilize the esophagus up to the inferior pulmonary vein, and we like to mobilize it 360 degrees, uh, taking care to preserve uh, the, um, the vagus, the anterior and posterior vagus. Uh, if you're not sure where the gastroesophageal junction is sitting, grab a scope and do a perioperative endoscopy. This will allow you to see exactly where the junction is and to avoid any approximation. And uh, if you're building a duplication, even if you're not building a duplication, it will allow you to make sure that you're restoring anatomy as it should be. Because especially if you have a very big fat pad, it's impossible for you to correctly position the Z line and the gastroesophageal Esophageal junction if you do not have a correct vision. If the esophagus is short, and Lee is going to talk about it, uh, you will need to be prepared to uh, perform a collis procedure, which is a lengthening procedure. This is a patient that had a uh, parasophageal hernia. We have mobilized the sac. We have dissected uh, the esophagus all the way up to the inferior pulmonary vein. We do a type 3 dissection in this patient, and now we're doing an endoscopy, and you see that the gastroesophageal junction is still sitting above the diaphragm. So this is a patient with a short esophagus. And if you have um, a, a patient like this, you know, if you're, you're just closing the hiatus and leaving everything like that, you're not going to do a functionally correct procedure. So you have to lengthen the esophagus. So what you want to do, you want to uh, gently bring the vagus uh, towards the right side of the screen in order to preserve it because we're going to use the fundus of the stomach in order to lengthen the esophagus over a scope or usually we use a 50 French bougie. We really want to make sure to lengthen uh, the uh, esophagus with a gastric tube that has the exact same diameter of the esophagus without making it too large of a tube because that's going to interfere with the emptying of, uh, of the, um, the esophagus. Um, I learned uh, to do this from Liam Bernard. Bernard really likes to create this tunnel um, below the vagus and below the um, uh, the, uh, the fat uh, covering uh, the vagus because it stabilizes the duplication that we're going to be um, building. So we um, we uh, prepare the um, uh, the fundus uh, to do this uh, wedge resection, which is the collis procedure. There is a uh, 50 French bougie that is already inside the stomach uh, and of course the esophagus. We are using 45. Um, uh, um, a stapler, stapler length of uh, a stapling device, as you can see here, and we, we do a triangular resection of the fundus. Lee's going to cover the details, but this is just to show you uh, how it looks like. So the first um, uh, uh, stapler is pointed uh, towards the, um, the bougie, as you can see here. And then the second one is parallel to the bougie. And once again, the diameter is extremely important. Of course, you can lengthen two centimeter, four centimeter, even six centimeter if necessary. This is really according to how short it is your esophagus and how long you want to lengthen um, the, um, the, uh, the esophagus. Of course, make sure that you don't grab the umbilical tape that we used to um, uh, perform the, uh, uh, the traction before and that you always see the tip of your staple. We like to overshow the stapler and then we're going to build a funduplication on top of the, um, uh, of the uh, newly created gastroesophageal junction. So now, do we need to build a funduplication or not? Uh, this is a very important step. It really depends on the um, clinical presentation of, uh, of the patient. Is the patient complaining of gastroesophageal symptoms in addition to other potential symptoms uh, that uh, you can have when dealing with a parasophageal hernia? Do we have a stomach that will allow us to do a funduplication or a nissen funduplication, or do we have a very uh, small rigid stomach that doesn't allow us to 
to do a fundal plication? Or uh, should we do if that patient, for instance, has very poor uh, motility and uh, is a um, over uh, 75 years old, should we do a partial fundal plication? So these are all uh, information that you should take into account when deciding whether that particular patient is, a, uh, is a, in need of having a funduplication. I have to say that we do like to add a funduplication usually uh, to our hyal hernia repair because we think it provides a, an additional stabilization uh, to um, our, our um, repair and, uh, and uh, we would normally do whenever possible a floppy uh, Nissen funduplication. So after having taken down the hiatus, uh, we build uh, the funduplication. And first, uh, you have to close the hiatus. Whenever possible, we like to use simple closure. Uh, the type of closure is going to be discussed tomorrow. Just as a general rule, um, the, 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 the facts that you have to take into uh, consideration are the size of the hiatus, but also the uh, status of the pillars. And uh, you should uh, uh, be able to close the hiatus without any tension or with the least possible tension that you can. We use 2O non-resorbable um, mercilin uh, sutures. We like to start the closure posteriorly and then add anterior suture uh, if needed. We try to stay away from measure, meshes whenever possible. And uh, if not possible, we will show you uh, tomorrow other ways of avoiding meshes, uh, bringing together nicely with no tension the two pillars. So this is how it looks like uh, in, uh, in the end. Um, uh, floppy funduplication, simple hiatal, um, hiatal closure, of course, the sac has been excised completely, so the duplication here is really sitting right where it should on top of the gastroesophageal junction. An alternative is to use pledgets. Uh, if uh, you removed some of the peritoneum covering of the pillars, or if you feel that the pillars are too thin and not strong enough, or if you want to reinforce, uh, you can reinforce using a vacuum mesh, which is a total resorbable mesh. It's going to be resorbed within two months. Mm -hmm. And this is the only mesh that I would suggest uh, to cut in a keyhole fashion as this. Again, it's totally resorbed. It's just a temporary reinforcement. So um, I'd like to thank you uh, very much. And just, just showing you this last sequence uh, to uh, share with you the fact that uh, you can do the same kind of repair also in the acute situation. This is a patient who presented with a a small perforation in the mediastinum, acute presentation with perforation. The patient was not in shock, was stable, and we did exactly the same step that we've seen before also in this acute case. Here, I would suggest an endoscopy on table that will allow you to see the status of the, um, of the stomach and also to check for the, um, the anatomy. So once again, with this take-home message, I'd like to thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any question. Thank you, thank you very much, Sivana. Uh, so it's a, it's a very nice demonstration of the key steps of the operation. And I think that uh, what is very important when you doing this sort of operation, and I know that there was a question regarding the starting point for this sort of repair, is really to keep on with these steps. And you have to make up your mind in respecting these dif different steps because We've tried all the different ways of doing that. And finally, after a long experience, there's something that we can reproduce systematically and it simplifies a lot the uh, treatment of these very challenging uh, hernias. Um, so uh, maybe Madi uh, backstage, uh, do you have some questions for the audience? Yes, thank you for your presentation, Professor ah, Beretta. Hi. From Mexico. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we will go quickly for the pool about the sac resection. And the question is, do you routinely remove the hernia sac during the adult hernia repair? Yes or no, please answer. And meanwhile, uh, we have here a question from a colleague that says uh, that in a less privileged country, they are have trouble doing a esophageal motility test or pH monitoring, and they re, uh, direct the medical treatment according to the um, 
to if they have a resolution of symptoms or not, they will go to the surgery. So the question goes with what are the preparative uh, tests that are indicated before surgery, and I mean that are mandatory to do it, even if they are low income countries? I think that whenever you can, you should run all the tests. Uh, but uh, for sure, uh, there are some tests that are mandatory. You cannot operate in a patient without doing an endoscopy. So for me, if I had to pick one test, uh, of course, I would uh, see the patient in the clinics and be very careful examining all the symptoms and then do a, an endoscopy and, if possible, a uh, radiologic study, mm -hmm. as, such as an upper GI swallow, which is also a proxy if you don't have a high-resolution manometer manometry at all if you look at the emptying of the barium or of the gastrographin it can give you a little bit of an idea of the emptying and the emptying time so it's not as precise as is a high resolution manometry but it's still a good test it's what we used to do also because if you have a very very large hernia you can have trouble in descending the uh, uh, the uh, manometry probe down. So very often, even when we can, uh, because we have the facility or uh, or we try, uh, we fail because it's very difficult. And we don't have to forget that here we're discussing hiatal hernia repair and not GERD patients. In a patient who doesn't have any hernia or a very small hernia and is presenting with uh, just simple reflex symptoms, there I would be uh, more strict in having a motility study in this kind of patient, of course course, pH uh, before uh, uh, considering the patient a surgical candidate. Lee, I don't know if you have any comment. No, I, I think you're exactly right. Endoscopy is very, very important. It gives the surgeon a lot of information, but only if the surgeon does it. So I think that's an important point. If you do fundoplications, you should be able to do an endoscopy, I'd say. And then, as you say, it really varies. Uh, patients with atypical symptoms, you don't know what's going on. PH test is absolutely mandatory. Maybe motility is not if they have no dysphagia and a normal barium swallow. Patients with dysphagia, typical symptoms, it's opposite. So it, it, it depends. But I think if you're going to do this, you have to have access to all those tests. Yeah. The, the question regarding this uh, preoperative workup. So if we're dealing with a patient <coughs> with this uh, large, uh, giant hyatalania, uh, what is your routine preoperative workup? And again, to respond to this question, I'm uh, in a low-income country or very poor access to the technologies. I have a patient with chest pain uh, on X-ray. On chest X-ray, you can see this <coughs> huge bubble in the chest, and you know there is a pyrosophagellania. So what would you do? You would go directly to surgery, or you try absolutely to have uh, endoscopy, or what are you doing? Um, I think an endo I'd say in that case, a barium swallow is very important, as long as they can swallow and aren't acute uh, like you demonstrated. But uh, I think an endoscopy is critical in that to make sure they don't have ischemic changes, uh, see what the shape of the measure, how far down the GE junction is. Uh, pH study in somebody like that is probably not important. Um, you, you don't know if they have reflux, but for sure, after you mobilize and reduce, they will have reflux, even yeah. if they don't. So, so that, that, that's why we're making this distinction between this large hyatalania and GERD, and probably there are two <clears> different <throat> diseases. And Lee, you are used to say that that's not the same disease. Yeah. Maybe they have common symptoms, but it's not the same disease. Yeah, I, I think uh, giant parasoptial hernias are actually a disease of the diaphragm more than of the GE junction or the stomach. Um, they have connective tissue disease, probably. Rita, you have other questions? Yes, thank you. I think we will go for the results of the poll. <coughs> and we have 77% that uh, routinely remove the hernia sac during the hotel urinary repair. <coughs> and we have here an interesting question that says, uh, how do you make sure you do not touch the vagus nerve while while you were resecting the sac and the sac is uh, very big? So what are your recommendations about? 
Silvana? Yes, uh, I can answer that question because uh, I know that uh, it's uh, everybody hates to remove the sack. It's uh, ugly, it's there, and uh, you just want to get rid of it. But uh, I think it's a very good question because I'm sure that if you look at the videos, even of experts, uh, to that point, that point of the operation, just take it out, and I'm sure that the vague is, uh, is lost in translation. What I do, I split it in two, and I take it, uh, uh, I take it down... Uh, pieces by pieces, making sure, one? not the, the, the sack. <laughs> uh, no, I don't split the vagus. So first of all, you have to know where the vagus is and see the vagus, but then you split the sack in two in the middle and you go, I go right and then left. So I, I don't just uh, grab one piece and take it, uh, take it totally uh, 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 down. Uh, and I think this way will allow you really to, to see where you're, you're going. And uh, uh, if you're using a ligature, uh, what you can do if you have a lot of fat is really uh, remove uh, the fat, <coughs> dissect the fat from the gastroesophageal junction uh, carefully uh, uh, and just don't do this cat, cat, cat with the uh, 10 millimeter ligature because that's not going to do it. You're going to go with the, both the vagus probably. Uh, Rita? Yes, uh, for those that say that they not routinely remove the sack, what do you do? You advise them to do, and what are the repercussions of not doing it? Remove it. I think that tomorrow Bernard <coughs> is going to show you some nice uh, videos of why you should remove it. Um, it is. It's. I. I don't know if we can say today that uh, if you don't remove it, that is a hundred percent related to recurrence, and that's the cause of recurrence. It could be something that can make a redo much more complex. And uh, uh, if you remove it, if you take it down. You have to remove it completely because not removing and removing it partially, I think, is even worse in my own experience <clears throat> redoing these patients than re re not touching it at all. Lee, you have comments. Um, I think there's a difference. I'm not sure when they, so many people said they don't remove the sac, whether they're talking about don't dissect it out of the mediastinum and just transect it, and that's very bad. The old paper by Barry Salky that uh, showed a very 30% recurrence rate if you didn't bring it into the abdomen. The rest of it's just, it's messy, it complicates redos, it probably doesn't influence recurrence per se, but uh, I agree with you, it's best to take, take, take it off. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So when we're talking about dissection of the sac is from the mediastinum, then clearance of the G-junction is easier because you free the G-junction, you clear the G-junction, and when you do partial total fund application, you don't have this big sac or big lipoma that stays within the valve and between the valve and the esophagus and may <clears throat> induce dysphagia. So if you can try to remove the sac, but always dissect it from the mediastinum. That's very important. So I think that uh, uh, we'll probably have other questions afterwards. And uh, as I was saying initially, uh, you know that uh, here in uh, Strasbourg, Ircad, we have the chance of uh, having Lee, who is almost full time, if not full time, with us now. So it's uh, it's a big expertise in our hands. So uh, uh, I like to thank uh, Lee for sharing this uh, webinar with us, and he will talk about a very important subject. And you've heard about that uh, so many times, even seeing papers that say that shoulder esophagus doesn't exist. Uh, there's, this is a sentence probably from a gynecologist, uh, and uh, Lee will explain uh, how to deal with this, uh, this issue of uh, length of the esophagus. So thank you, Lee. Uh, you're welcome, Bernard and Silvana. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, as Bernard says, this is a controversial subject, actually. I would say quite a few surgeons argue that this doesn't exist. Um, I'm not going to concentrate so much on the technical parts because Silvana gave a, a great demonstration of, of how to do it, but I, I think this really demands explanation of, of why this comes about and what effect it has on, on the um, patient and the outcomes of the patients. And uh, hopefully, if you're one of the ones that believes it doesn't exist, by the end of this, you'll uh, believe that it does. So I uh, always uh, tell fellows and residents to beware the short esophagus. And uh, uh, that's 
kind of a funny thing to say, like it's frightening and dangerous to the patients, but it's a very subtle finding. It's very easy for surgeons to talk themselves out of uh, the fact that it's there. Uh, it's very easy to kind of say, I think it's long enough. And because of that, uh, surgeons can really be tricked into not addressing it. And recurrence rate is quite high if you don't. We know that uh, there's a wide spectrum of recurrence rates, uh, even in expert series. And a lot of that's due to, uh, for sure, wrap herniation and disruption. Uh, but those, in, in effect, are due to tension. So primary violation of hernia repairs, uh, of course, is a repair under tension. Uh, and if you have either a wrap that's too tight and under tension, it's bound to uh, fail. But also, if you're pulling too hard to get the esophagus down, even if it's down, if you can't let go of it and have it come back up, uh, that's obviously going to lead to a repair under tension uh, and a higher risk of failure. Uh, you can see that if you look at the standard explanation of how fundoplications fail. Um, if you look at this, uh, at least two of these failure modes, if not three, are due to a short esophagus, essentially. There's ax axial caudal ten or cephalad ten tension on the esophagus, and that can either tear the wrap apart, it can pull the esophagus through the wrap, or it can pull the wrap and the GE junction back up into the mediastinum. So, of course, in all the classic papers on uh, Nissen fundoplication or any fundoplication, you see mandatory techniques to minimize tension. And Silvana illustrated that very well. Of course, wrap tension to make it floppy, uh, uh, to divide short gastrics, to prevent uh, torsional tension. And for axial esophageal tension, uh, really the hallmark is, as you just saw, uh, to do dissection. And many surgeons are very timid about dissecting in the mediastinum. It's full of frightening um, objects. You're, as you saw in those nice videos, right on top of the aorta, the heart's immediately above you, pulmonary vein. Uh, and I think one of the key errors that uh, young surgeons make or people that uh, don't do a lot of this work is to be afraid of operating inside the mediastinum. Uh, it, it's very rare for people to injure major organs in the mediastinum because you have an axial approach uh, and really it's quite safe and you should uh, dissect liberally uh, inside the mediastinum. I think that's kind of the primary thing. You should also be aware of which patients are at high risk of having a short esophagus uh, and that way you can be prepared in the operating room. And we often uh, schedule a patient for a possible colus and prep them so that they're ready to do that and have the right instruments, staplers, and things like that in the room if they meet this kind of criteria. Uh, as we've been talking about, giant parasophageal hernias uh, are prone to this. Um, uh, almost by definition, a type three, giant type three uh, parasophageal hernia has a GE junction well into the mediastinum. It may be an accordioned esophagus, uh, but may also be intrinsic shortening of the esophagus. Shortening of the esophagus happens because of chronic inflammatory changes um, there, and that's, of course, from chronic peptic esophagitis, causes shortening of the esophagus. And a hallmark of that can be long strictures. We don't see strictures that often anymore, uh, but if you do, uh, those, pa those esophagus uh, aren't that good at uh, uh, being able to stretch back down into the abdomen. Barrett's esophagus is another chronic inflammatory change of the esophagus. And uh, when we've looked at our retrospective data, uh, we had many more percentage of Barrett's uh, cases than we had uh, of non-Barrett's in the Collis group. Uh, and of course, active esophagitis, and you really shouldn't operate or do uh, uh, anti-reflux uh, repair on patients that have uncontrolled active esophagitis, you should treat them medically first uh, to get rid of that, or uh, you'll not only have a short esophagus, but in mobilizing and trying to pull it down into the abdomen, you might tear it in half, which is uh, definitely not a good thing. So there's two basic approaches uh, uh, to doing this. Um, um, kind of in the beginning, um, uh, obviously a traditional open collis is done through the left chest. Uh, and in the beginning, we tried to replicate uh, kind of the traditional approach. And this can be done with minimally invasive techniques. 
if you're comfortable with thoracoscopy, uh, uh, you can uh, put a trocar either in the right chest or more typically in the left chest. Uh, deflate the left lung just with positive pressure pneumoperitoneum. Advance the um, stapler into the, per into the abdominal cavity and feed the stomach in, of course, with the bougie in place as you, as you showed, and then do a single firing of the stapler and that will uh, lengthen the esophagus as long as you want it. You have a lot of control with that technique because you can control exactly how long your neoesophagus is going to be, uh, but it does require um, comfort of operating in the um, uh, thorax. And this is kind of what it looks like, just advancing the stapler across the mediastinal pleura, feed the stomach in uh, with, uh, usually we use about a 48 French bougie, and that will give you a, a 60 French um, neoesophagus. And then, of course, you do your fundal plication around that neoesophagus, putting the fundal plication as high as possible around the neoesophagus. And I'll explain why that's an important technical point uh, next. And uh, the question of do, doing a full or partial wrap uh, depends on esophageal motility and your own philosophy. Some people uh, do only one or the other. Uh, other people, I think like us, tailor to some extent based on symptoms of dysphagia or motility problems. So uh, unfortunately my video didn't embed, so let's go to a, a video here. Oops, I don't know. I lost my videos. So he is looking for his uh, while he is uh, looking for his uh, picture. Madi Rita, you have uh, maybe some questions? Yeah, we'll do a short question while we are waiting for the video, and that yeah. is about the use of the bougie for calibration. What is the ideal size that you uh, recommend? So you have to realize that staplers don't divide exactly either to the end or parallel to the edge. So, you, uh, you know, we typically do a repair around a 58 or 60 French bougie. And for that reason, um, we would use a smaller um, bougie so that in the end, the result's the same. And so we use a 45 or 48 French bougie and that results in a, a 60 French, uh, essentially neoesophagus. Very important not to have a dilated or too big neoesophagus. Uh, because of Laplace's law, uh, that will have a lot of bolus pressure on it and tend to dilate over time and become patchless. So I'll show you kind of the old uh, thoracic uh, collis. So in the meantime, we do another question for Professor Dalamani, I think, uh, for the time. Uh, and that is about um, when you decide to suture the anterior part of the diaphragm. Uh, I, I think that um, it depends on the size. Uh, the fact, and uh, Silvana will comment about that, is that usually everybody is doing a posterior career repair. Why is it? Is because it's a place where you get good musculature on the on the crura. And the anterior <coughs> part of or the, the superior part of the, of the crura muscles is not as strong as the lower part where you have a lot of fibers. So that's where we're starting. And then when you have very large hiatus, if you start down progressively, you will close the hiatus at some point. If you continue the posterior repair, you will create an angulation of the esophagus. And that's a risk of dysphagia. So we try always to maintain the esophagus in a straight line and not angulating because of the posterior career repair. And that's at this point that we're deciding to combine with the anterior stitches. Lee, uh, function? Yes. Okay, Lee, are we going back to the video of Lee? So, sorry about that. So this, this is the transthoracic approach. You can see a sh obviously a short esophagus as you saw earlier. Uh, 
patient with uh, Barrett's, uh, as we said. This is through the left chest. So we simply put a 10 millimeter, 12 millimeter trocar in the left chest, forced intercostal space. Uh, make sure there's no adhesions down in the posterior um, medial uh, pleura. Transilluminate, as you saw with the scope, withdraw the scope, and advance an articulating stapler into the peritoneal cavity. And uh, you have to previously mobilize the stomach, so the short gastrics are all taken. And then you snug this up against that 45 French bougie. And this is quite a short esophagus, so we're going to do a fairly long. You can use a 30, 30 millimeter, 45, or a 60 millimeter uh, staple load, depending on anyone. And then you just withdraw it and you turn the insufflation off in the left, left chest, the lung re expands, uh, and you just proceed with uh, fundoplication. Um, as normal. So this is about a, a three centimeters of that uh, is in the abdomen, three centimeters in the um, um, thorax. And then uh, just to kind of recapitulate, this is a very brief uh, illustration of what Silvana showed in a very nice uh, way, which is uh, the wedge fundoplasty, where you actually resect uh, part of the cardia um, using uh, usually about three staple loads to uh, accomplish it. Once again, with a bougie, uh, small bougie, because uh, obviously staplers don't staple all the way to the tip. Didn't quite get it far enough. Second firing. And this is by far the most common way um, of doing it. I still do the thoracic approach because it's a single staple firing, but um, in the end, they're um, very similar uh, results. And I think if you're going to go to the bother of doing this, you should do at least three or four centimeters of, of lengthening. Um, there. And you can see it looks uh, just about like the thoracic one did. And now we have a nice long intra-abdominal neoesophagus. I think you've heard all of us kind of emphasize that neoesophagus aspect of it, and I'll show why that is. And that's because of the well-known results uh, following collis uh, procedures. And this is one of the reasons why we try very hard not to do collis procedures. In fact, uh, although one of my partners in Portland uh, does about 30% colluses, I think most of us do around three or 4% uh, of the collis. And as you can see, these patients were complex. Uh, this is an old paper that we did, but almost all of them were PHs or stricture patients, sometimes a redo. Obviously, if the patient failed because of a short esophagus, hernia of the wrap in the medial sinus, you have to be very concerned that they did it because it had a short esophagus. Um, and it was very effective, 97% symptom improvement. This is a very good technique to take care of their reflux. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at this, 18% of the patients had uh, esophagitis uh, and 43% had abnormal 24 hour pH studies. And you, you may think that that's because this was a bad procedure or it failed. Uh, but in fact, if you see the drawing, you're creating that neoesophagus and it has eccentric cells in it. And if your fundoplication, if your high pressure zone uh, is at the end of that, uh, you can have trapped acid being produced in the distal esophagus that's asymptomatic to the patient. But I think you'd agree, Silvana, often when you scope these patients, they have a little ring of esophagitis uh, around it. Probably not at much uh, risk for developing Barrett's, uh, although that's illustrated here because they don't have bile mixed content reflux. But uh, for this reason, I, I really think a liberal use of colis is probably not a good idea. I think no use of colis is not a good idea. 
Uh, and I think most people that have a tailored approach find around 4% of the time. They need it. And uh, just to show that uh, there are some long-term um, aspects of this, uh, once again, uh, you have simply, it's a non-physiologic treatment. It's palliative because the only other option for some of these patients is an esophagectomy. And uh, I think you can accept a 29% uh, incidence of uh, medication use uh, because medicines are so good these days. So thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you, Lee. Uh, when I was looking at your results and you mentioned the control of reflux, and uh, in our experience, what is interesting is that usually you have to do that in very severe grade of uh, reflux, so very severe disease. And those patients they have terrible symptoms. They don't have only heartburn, but they have regurgitation. Mm. And this is probably the most spectacular with the, with the colis, is that these patients are very well because they have no regurgitation anymore. And they accept the fact to have to take one PPI twice a week or mm -hmm. one time a week, etc. So it's something that is really focused on very severe disease. That's where you find this sort of virus. And it provides a very nice uh, control of uh, reflux. Yeah, yeah it's... Um... And, and that is most important to the patients, that volume regurgitation. If you can stop that, they tend to be happy. I, I can see that Carl is with us still. Uh, you are in Germany, Carl, or you are in San Diego? Mm. You're mute. Push, push on your mic. Mute. I'm mute. I, uh, yes. I sort of got out of San Diego when, uh, when uh, <laughs> okay. uh, the president said we cut off the line to Europe. <laughs> and uh, I'm in, in Germany. When the Americans then, went crazy. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's coming to Germany, so you're okay. Uh, what, what's, what's your opinion regarding Collis? Well, I, I just, I, I agree completely to every, I think, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, I can just uh, say that I uh, favor the, the, the technique Silvana showed. Uh, um, uh, uh, ages ago, we had this flexible stapler where we could move in the, the lower abdominal quadrant, then make a bend and, and do the what, what Lee showed. And that was pretty nice. And um, uh, uh, again, I think it's bad if you, if you just uh, have a short esophagus and you pull it down, make your funnel blockation, droops and let it go up uh, into the thorax again, probably at the end of the operation. So I think something must be done. I think that's very important. Yeah, uh, besides the problem of esophagitis that we know and we know why, what sort of problem have you seen with the colis? Because in the past, some people were saying that it was not a good operation because you get dilation of the lower esophagus and uh, you create pseudo diverticulum, et cetera. W what, is, what is reality in that? Well, I think that's simple physics. Uh, certainly the musculature of the upper stomach is not as robust as, uh, you know, there's no circular fibers, they're more disorganized, so there's re less resistant. But if, if you make that just a little bit too wide, wider than the esophagus, uh, the, you know, because of, as I mentioned, the Laplace's law, the pressure triples uh, the luminal pressure and it will rapidly dilate. So I, I think you need to make that exactly the diameter of the native esophagus, or maybe even a little bit smaller, uh, to keep that from happening. So it's a very important uh, technical thing. And uh, another thing, especially here in Europe, I think because colis is not known. Uh, I had the, from the colis I made. Um, I had the patients then contract, uh, partly by the gastroenterologist. And then they, they come back and say, oh, well, I have a hernia again, because yeah, the gastroenterologist document a hernia of so many centimeters. Right. And it burned me up all the time because I tried to tell them this is a different operation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same in France. <laughs> yeah, same in the United States, yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes if, if you don't know, if I see a patient and didn't mm -hmm. know that they had a colis, you see gastric folds up in the distal esophagus right, and right. it can be, be difficult to tell that you don't have either a slipped Nissen or a, a hiatal hernia. Right, right. So we're going back backstage, Madi, Rita. One other question is uh, the potential leak of the stapler line. Mm -hmm. So the question is, do you routinely over suture the stapler line? And the second will be, if there's any complication, how do you manage it? Allez, Silvana. 
Yeah, he's always referring to me when it comes to complications. Thank you very much, but because I'm taking care of them, not because I'm the only, the only one having them. No, we. Uh, I like to oversew, and I like to oversew, especially the, the the distal part. So it's going to be the proximal part of the staple line. The one is in Eumediastinum um, uh, 3O PS or Vicryl, whatever you want. But uh, I like to oversew. If you have a leak, um, the first thing is. Uh, pick it up immediately uh, if the, the patient should look spectacular after a laparoscopic procedure if she or he it doesn't uh, something is wrong and uh, you want to do a uh, uh, either an endoscopy directly or you can do an upper gi series or a cd scan with oral contrast and uh, you'll pick it up the leak and then you can uh, um, either place a stent or if it's a really acute and fresh you can clip it with an over the scope clip that's what i would do but uh, the most important thing is whenever you staple or whenever you do a complex operation and uh, something is not going exactly as it should think about it and uh, they, they try to to catch it up really uh, early uh, yeah i would say it's very rare to have a delayed leak after a collis repair unlike uh, epiphrenic diverticulum where leaks are fairly common um, and that's because you do a fundal plication around it i tend to invert the staple line inside the wrap and so it's fairly well protected what you do see is we all know staplers aren't perfect is sometimes you fire the stapler and it doesn't cut right or it fails or the staples don't close and the thing falls apart and uh, the, really the first person that described a laparoscopic uh, collis procedure was uh, our old friend ario de paula and he used to do it uh, hand sewn. He right. would just take a pair of scissors, yeah, actually cut cut down like that, and then he would hand hand sew the resulting thing. So you can can do it that way. But uh, so stapler lines occasionally fail. It's one of the reasons I like the transthoracic approach because it's one single firing and no crossing staple lines. But um, um, I will say the, the one possible complication of the transthoracic approach is you can have, you have to watch carefully that you don't have necrosis of the tip uh, of the gastric uh, fundus because you've mobilized short gastrics. Uh, you're moving it away from the um, uh, left gastric artery and uh, you should check for ischemia. These days you can do fluorescent imaging and make sure it's okay. Okay. Nadi, Rita? Yes, we do have another question and that's also about the risks of uh, collex uh, gastroplasty. Um, what is the risk of damage of the left vagus nerve? Is there any risk? I think that uh, Silvana can command because uh, the about the technique that we show. Yeah, we like to mobilize as we would do for, a, we, we don't do it anymore, laparoscopic heller procedure, I was going to say, but uh, with point, we don't we do it very, very rarely. So you really want to identify the vagus and uh, really shift it, gently mobilize it uh, uh, to the right side of, uh, of the patient. So really moving it away from your, uh, from your operating field and where you're going to apply your, your staple. So you, you, you want to mobilize it on blo in block with all the fat pad, the Belsimar fat, fat pad that's there, and, you, and you, you, you take it to the other side. Now the main difference with or without Curly's for us is that when we're doing a formal descent on application, the vagus trunks are inside of the valve. When we're doing a Curly's, the vagus trunks are getting out of the valve, and the valve is between the this, this vagus and the, the, the vagus trunk. So, we know that we preserve, we don't stitch the vagus trunks because they are away. So that's the difference between a normal repair and the lengthening. Uh, back, okay. Yes, thank you. Um, we have another poll question. And although it's a topic that we are going to discuss tomorrow, which is meshes, uh, we have many, many questions about mesh. So I think it's good to discuss it briefly uh, today as well. And I invite everyone here with us to also join us tomorrow. The question is, when I need, I regularly use synthetic mesh during hiatal hernia repairs. And the answer is yes or no. So we wait for yeah. the answer. But so we, we, can, yeah. we can ask a question to Lee uh, and, uh, and Silvana regarding the use of mesh. I know the answer of Silvana, of course. <laughs> but, uh... <clears throat> yeah, um, uh, we don't use synthetic mesh, even though that's effective at stopping recurrence. Uh, 
And if you deal with a few patients with mesh erosion, uh, it quickly makes you disenchanted with the, the thing. And, and like you guys do, we use an absorbable mesh. We used to use biologics, but they're so expensive um, and probably don't offer that much advantage, um, but uh, an absorbable mesh uh, of some kind of which there's many. Yeah, well, we, we um, I, I, I totally agree. O only in giant repairs, only in yeah. big repairs, not in a De routine. Definitely not routinely. The first thing is simple closure. And then if if we have some problem, pledge it its future and then uh, uh, relaxing incision on the diaphragm to bring it together. But uh, I think that probably it's going to not even once a year. We I know that it. Cal is using a lot of mesh. <laughs> 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 no, I, I, I think uh, we, we were the gathering point for all the mesh problems in Frankfurt. And so I, I, I made the same experience as uh, you guys did. Uh, we had so many horrible uh, cases that I really got from a, from a moderate user. I, I went to a very critical uh, person regarding mesh. And uh, so I would always try all the best I could do to have a, a suture closure and then see. And if you look at the literature, it's, uh, it's very, it's very uh, controversial what, what, what should be based on. So I think, you know, if in cases I, I can't get the hiatus closed, okay, then, uh, then a uh, absorbable mesh uh, for some time to support the sutures. Okay. I, I think it's interesting, though, is when you certainly all of us that work in a tertiary foregut center tend not to do mesh. I don't know anybody that does a permanent mesh. In a, but when they've done polls of the population of surgeons oh, yeah. that yeah, do yeah. mesh, a substantial number of them, 40%, uh, um, use mesh, often uh, uh, we synthetic. We know that because we have the answer of the poll. Exactly. We have the answer. We can show it on the screen. So. 31% oh. uses a synthetic mesh. And maybe one of the questions that they might have is if you use a uh, absorbable mesh like Vicryl, uh, which is going to be absorbed, I think within six to eight weeks, what is the risk of a recurrence in that case? It really it prevents early recurrence. So we are looking at our data and I think uh, we uh, haven't uh, got enough information to see if it does prevent also long-term recurrence, but it does, I think, prevent early recurrence, which I think is also the period where you can have most of the recurrence. This, so. this is very important, what uh, Sivan is saying, is that uh, the, the time of uh, follow-up is so important in this type of disease because we have seen so many data regarding mesh use and they have six months follow-up, they have 12 months follow-up and it's it. We have never seen very long-term follow-up besides the tribe in the United States and not a tribe in Australia looking at long-term. And we did a long-term study in patients up to 10 years and we could see the recurrence rate uh, being uh, bigger, bigger, and bigger with time passing. So time is an issue in the, 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 the incident of frequency. That's why when you look at the literature on mesh repair, look at the follow-up. This is the most important. And, and tomorrow I will talk a little bit about recurrence. And I will show you that time is an issue when we're talking about recurrence, mesh or no mesh. This is very important. Mm -hmm. my, my good friend, John Hunter, used to always say if patients, if parasophageal patients would live long enough, 100% of them would recur. And he's probably right, because it's a, it's a muscle disease. Yeah. Um, uh, although I will say we just published um, um, with my Portland group uh, a randomized prospective phasics absorbable mesh uh, uh, there. And at three years, uh, had about 50% less recurrences. So, you know, you, you buy a patient three or four or five years from a redo yeah. surgery, it's probably important and worth it. Yes, we have another question, and that is a question I've seen uh, before, is when you do your cruroplasty and you do the application after that, and you're still not very, very happy. <clears throat> I've seen some colleagues uh, performing a suture, like a, a gastropexy, with one suture to the uh, anterior crust. What is your opinion about that, and okay. should that be done or That's not? That's a good question, because on one side, we have people doing that, and on the other side, people who don't do that. 
So uh, we start with the one who is doing that, Lee. Uh, yeah, I, I put it, I don't put it anterior, but I do put a posterior uh, pexy stitch to kind of stabilize the wrap from rotation, rotating and, and uh, moving around. I don't think it pre prevents re uh, migration or anything like that, but um, uh, it just makes makes me feel like it's more solid um, there. I use a lot of sutures when I do uh, I know. fund application. <laughs> yes, I can tell you that I've been redoing a lot of patients, not your patient, your patient are in the US and they're, they're fine, but a lot of patients with uh, a lot of uh, anchoring posterior anterior lateral stitches that do not prevent recurrence at all i don't think it's i think lee is being very honest he says makes me feel better mm -hmm. it, it, it's it's not preventing anything yeah. what what you can have sometimes it will make your duplication more um, sit better in yeah. some it's, stomachs it stays nicer, it stays on the nicer yeah. in the picture that's why i, that's yes. why I do it <laughs> yes. yeah, what are you doing well, I think that would be all ha has always been a sign of my desperate mood when I do these kind of sutures <laughs> at the end of the operation. But I agree with Lee, you know, it would be nice to have at the end a fixation posteriorly where the stomach is naturally fixed. And but um, I, I hardly sometimes find a, a strong tissue to to fix it somewhere, just like I would <laughs> heal it in the posterior gastropexy. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, you have uh, still some questions from the audience? Yes, we have another question. For the technical detail when you're resecting the sac, what happens if you do a pleural opening or laceration? Does, does it have any consequences? No, not at all. I'm, it happens very often, and uh, you just uh, try to uh, talk to the anesthesiologist if uh, he or she is in the room, and uh, and uh, communicate that you made an opening into the pleura, and they will just adapt if necessary the peep pressure, increasing it slightly. Um, I think it's very important to talk to them, uh, but it's very important also that you mention that nothing should be done, no chest tube, and uh, most of all. Don't try to fix it and close it, shut it down, because then you will have a tension pneumothorax. So it's uh, something that is, uh, I would say, uh, not even a uh, complication. It's just a uh, part of the di dissection itself. And don't worry about it. Uh, um, don't close it. And just uh, talk to the anesthesiologist. And don't let the anesthesiologist get the x-ray in the recovery room, because you'll get an emergency <laughs> call. Or... They, they, they always do it, do mm -hmm. it here, yeah, at least. And we say, you will get the pneumo operator and but please don't call me, I know it. So, uh, but I used to do it. So just uh, don't do anything as Sylvana is mentioning. In, in fact, um, in Portland, Steve Demeester, uh, when he has a, Blair may talk about this tomorrow, when he has a difficult hiatus to close, he deliberately uh, collapses both. Yeah, that's right. And keep in mind that we are also doing thoracoscopic operation with pneumoperator now, I mean, the patient is not dying. So, uh, uh, okay, uh, next. Last one, there is no one who wants to talk, Madi? No, we can- No, no again. one has raised well, we his can, hand. We can try, we have a colleague raising a hand. It's all try right. it. Yes, that is colleague Jovan Picula. Jovan, Jovan Picula. go ahead. Please ask your question. No success, unfortunately. I think most questions have been addressed today. Um, um, still many questions about the mesh, but I think we address okay. them for now. But if you have the question for choosing on the, the tour for, for next. Oh, I'll ask a question. Uh, uh, me question. is a question. So, so I'm, I'm shocked in this day and age that no, nobody in the audience asks, uh, uh, are you guys using the robot? to do uh, parasophageal, okay, uh, giant we'll parasophageal. <laughs> no, no, okay, no, that's a good question. So I know that Carl is a, is a passionate of uh, robots. So Carl, are you using the robot all the time? It's mandatory in San Diego. <laughs> yeah, it, it is mandatory in San Diego, yeah. Mute. So, but uh, mute. It, it, it can't I, hear you. I, I, it's mandatory in San Diego. There is a lot of um, uh, repairs done with the robot. So, but that's also because they have a lot in the OR but uh, you know, bring it back to the German situation, um, then the most of the idle hernia repairs are done with a laparoscopic technique. And uh, I think 
for the time being, this is okay. In the next five years, we will work out what the advantages are over the laparoscopic technique, I guess. That's a nice conclusion. So all the different topics regarding mesh, uh, reduce, uh, complication, etc., cetera, uh, are the topics for uh, tomorrow. So uh, we've, we've got a quite significant number of people uh, today. So we hope that you have enjoyed this first session. Just to remind you that the next, next day, uh, tomorrow is Friday, same time, uh, we will cover the topic of uh, the closure of the hiatus, so addressing the issues of mesh or alternative techniques, etc. Uh, we'll cover the problem of frequent hernia, what should we do if we have a recurrence. And finally, we will talk uh, with John Hunter about the complication associated with this type of surgery. So it's again, very interesting topics. Uh, today, personally, I enjoyed that a lot. So thank you very much, Sylvana and Lee. I hope that you have enjoyed also, and uh, we're gonna see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.